Hello and welcome to thegunblog.ca. My name is Nicholas Johnson. My guest today is Terry Bryant, the Chief Firearms Officer of Alberta. Hello, Terry. Thank you for being here. Hi, uh, Nicholas. It's a great pleasure. I always enjoy an opportunity to uh, address uh, the firearms community and the general public on issues relating to firearms and public well, safety. Well, thank you for, for, for being my guest, and thank you especially for being the Chief Firearms Officer of Alberta. I'm just going to give a quick intro here. A lot of us became aware of you when you testified to the Senate committee ex uh, examining Bill C-71 back in 2018. And um, you said some, you, you were one of the experts uh, on the law and advocating for firearm users. You have some, you've also been a member of the Alberta Firearms Advisory Committee, a director of the Canadian Shooting Sports Association, secretary of the Alberta Arms and Cartridge Collectors Association, president of the Military Collectors Club of Canada, you have a PhD in international business and you were an associate professor of business at the University of Calgary. And, and why am I mentioning this background? Because I believe you are one of the relatively few provincial chief firearms officers who doesn't come from policing. And, and you are just to also say, sit through the timeline here, you, um, you were announced in the summer of 2021 as becoming the chief firearms officer. You officially took over on September 1st of 2021. So how has it been for the past 18 months? Uh, well, it's been uh, very hectic. Uh, my deputy often uses the term uh, drinking from a fire hose. Um, so first of all, when we took over, we basically started from ground zero. So, you know, with basically an empty office and a handful of employees and built it up to uh, having a viable operation now. So there were a lot of operational challenges, just getting things going. Um, but you know, part of my experience uh, in the past as a, as a manager has been starting things from scratch. So that came in handy. Uh, and then, of course, we've faced an unprecedented number of attacks on the firearms community from the federal government uh, over this past, uh, you know, year or two years. So um, that's something that well, I guess it's now three years, um, really. So it, that has really been... Uh, more than anyone, I think, could have anticipated um, as a number of challenges just keep rolling in every day. It's, it's really incredible. We'll get into some of the, you know, how you got here and, and where you're headed. But uh, these days, uh, 18 months into the job in the c current situation with the province and the federal government <coughs> and the, the legislation and, and so forth, what keeps you up at night? Well, um, I guess... Any, any job that I've had, I've always taken my responsibilities very seriously. And um, so what keeps me up, up at night sometimes is that I don't want to let people down, um, you know, whether that's individuals who may have contacted me about a situation uh, and we're trying to make sure that they uh, get a satisfactory resolution, or whether it's the community as a whole, the firearms community, or the people of Alberta as a whole, um, you know, I have a very strong sense of responsibility and anytime I think there's something that, uh, you know, that, that threatens my ability to deliver, uh, that's what keeps me awake at night. I'm, I'm, the word conscientious comes to mind and, and it sounds like you take you're taking this job very seriously. Well, um, when I took this job, um, I didn't really know what I was going to be getting involved in. Um, I, I was told I'd be able to do it from, uh, from my home in Calgary. Uh, subsequently, I ended up renting an apartment in Edmonton because I spent so much time up here. Uh, I basically worked seven days a week all the time. Uh, so uh, it is a very substantial commitment. And I'd like to also... There's there's so much here between your 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 role as as an individual as a as a I'm going to call it a a large scale uh, firearm collector focusing on on military firearms and and your expertise there so you're directly concerned by some of the legislation and policies and you were named as a firearms advocate with as the province of Alberta was deliberately fighting the federal government's attack so a, a role that even though you're a I, I'm going to use the word federal bureaucrat your role has been politicized or is politicized. 
And there's also this context, right? The, the context of this, this, these attacks from the federal government against all government, uh, all um, government licensed firearm owners across Canada, not only Alberta. And Alberta is quite unique and, and one of the very few provinces that has taken the step of switching from a federal, federally appointed chief firearms officer, CFO, to a provincially appointed one. And so there's this incredible context, a personal context, a political context, a policy context that I hope we'll get into and explore over, over our time together. Well, thank you. There's, there's a few things there that I should, I guess, comment on. So first of all, I am, uh, if I'm a bureaucrat, then I'm a provincial bureaucrat. Uh, so my paycheck comes from the government of Alberta. Um, that's what it means to, to uh, sort of opt in and go provincial. Uh, the majority of provinces actually now have provincially appointed chief firearms officers. Um, those uh, There's only, I think, about three provinces that are still federally appointed. So about 85% of Canada's population is actually in provinces that have a provincially appointed chief firearms officer. But a lot depends on um, the role that they are appointed to fill. So it's not just who appoints them, but what their mandate is. So uh, of the chief firearms officers that are provincially appointed, uh, two, for example, are police officers. So they clearly are not allowed to have a, a political role. Um, many of the others are, um, their mandate simply doesn't include it. Um, but the, the recent transitions from federal to provincial uh, appointment, in other words, Saskatchewan and Alberta, uh, it was a part of our mandate to advocate for common sense rules. And uh, I don't actually view that as uh, politicizing the position. I, really, I, I, I think that people always have uh, a political role when they are uh, involved with a government program. So I've, I've had people who are provincial or, or, or sorry, who are federally appointed uh, in the Canadian firearms program, either as CFOs or in other roles. And they say, oh, well, we're not political. Well, if you are doing something that is, uh, you, that is dictated to you by a politician that has a major impact on a community, any community, then that's political. And to deny that, I think, is not realistic. So what we have done is simply recognize that um, there are political ramifications to the activities of a chief firearms officer. And so let's be open about what that is. And um, instead of simply saying, well, we have to uh, just do whatever we're told, regardless of whether it makes sense or not, uh, let's actually make an explicit part of the CFO mandate to uh, advocate for things that do make sense. I want to respond to now. First, of all, I want to say thank you for 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 uh, correcting or clarifying. And, all, and this is part of why I'm so happy to have you here because there's a lot of assumptions I have or or thoughts that I have, and, and I'm going to share them with you. And you're going to tell me, yeah, this one's right and that one's wrong, <laughs> and, and that bring me up to date. The, the I felt relief when when uh, uh, at your nomination, kind of relief and kind of excitement, mm -hmm. excitement and inspiration. Yes, Alberta's standing up for us, and that's why. Al the the Alberta naming you is not only an Alberta story; it's it's a it's a cross Canada story, and there are Canadian gun owners, well, gun owners across the country, who are who are cheering for you, cheering for Alberta, mm -hmm. and and it's a joke, right? It, it, mm -hmm. Let's move to Alberta. Like it's it's a joke that probably some people have mm -hmm. fulfilled upon. So it's a you're an inspiration. This this story that's happening here is an is an inspiration. In the in the quote, when the I'm going to call it the culture quote, uh, the culture war here in quotes, but also as a as a gun owner, more of a, from the policy angle, I feel like there's someone holding your position who understands the reality of gun ownership, and so there's there's an inspiration and a relief. Do you hear that a lot? Well, um, as I mentioned, I, I work usually seven days a week, and on the weekends, that's usually at a um, at a, an event, uh, often a gun show or sometimes a, a, com a competition, the Ipswich Nationals or a cowboy action match or something like that. Um, and I do actually have a lot of people 
who come up to me and say, you know, we're so glad that you're finally giving us a voice uh, because there are a lot of people in this country, not just in the firearms community, but other people, particularly in rural areas and, and areas, out, you know, uh, and not just on the firearms issue, they feel they're not getting a voice. And so um, I, I mentioned my sense of responsibility, and I feel that very acutely when, you know, people will wait in line for 10 minutes to shake my hand and thank me and say, we're so glad you're giving us a voice. But, you know, the other aspect of that, though, is that um, what I really would like uh, is not just to be cheered by the firearms community, but I think uh, if people really understood what we are doing, then ordinary people all across Canada, uh, in Alberta and elsewhere, would also be uh, cheering us on uh, because what we are attempting to do is to head off uh, a massive diversion of resources in directions that are uh, not just unproductive, but likely counterproductive. And so uh, if I think if people, the ordinary Canadian, the ordinary Albertan, if they really understood um, this issue, they would um, be very supportive of what we're doing and also uh, be strong supporters of our office. But unfortunately, uh, although there are outlets um, primarily within the firearms community that are addressing these issues, the, um, those outlets um, tend to not reach the general public. Um, and so there's a, a, a need to get that message out so that the general public realizes what's at stake here and that uh, although the federal government has massive propaganda resources to use uh, in advancing their ideas, uh, a lot of propaganda doesn't really make for, doesn't mean that something is actually effective. In fact, if you're using a massive propaganda machine to sell something, it probably means that it can't be sold on its own merits. It should, it, if, if you, if it, it should sell itself, if it's, if the thing is actually working, I, I guess that's the, can you say more yeah. about specifically what the, the public, about what you're doing that the public either doesn't know about or doesn't fully understand? Well, uh, I guess there's two things. One is what we're arguing against. The other is what we're arguing for. So what we're arguing against, uh, largely is, uh, the idea that public safety can be promoted by prohibiting specific types of firearms. Uh, and you can get into an endless and unusually unproductive debate about exactly, well, this one is good, that one is bad, this one is in between, and so on. Really, that's a, a completely unproductive direction for uh, the allocation of resources uh, for public safety purposes. Because uh, the approach that we take uh, is that if someone shouldn't have a firearm, they shouldn't have any firearm. Decide, uh, you know, trying to um, improve public safety by saying, well, you can't have this one because it'll hold six rounds, but you can have that one because it'll hold five rounds. Um, that's really not uh, a productive way of. Uh, approaching the public safety issue. So uh, what we need to be doing is focusing on who it is that is allowed legal access to firearms. And if someone is unsuitable for firearms ownership, and there are unfortunately people in our society who should not be allowed legal access to firearms, um, then we need to focus on making sure that they don't get legal access to firearms and not worry about whether the people who are okay to have a gun have a gun that will hold six rounds or five. That's just not uh, a productive way of looking at it. And I don't think ordinary Canadians realize, uh, because, you know, let's face it, the majority of Canadians are not gun owners. Many of them have no exposure to firearms, or if they did have any, it was 
well, when I was a kid, I went out to my, you know, my Uncle Bob's farm and uh, I saw him shoot a gopher once. Uh, and that's their entire, you know, legal ex uh, exposure to the legal ownership of firearms. But what people don't realize is that, you know, they, they say things like, well, we should get rid of this or we should get rid of that. But these measures are not costless. You know, when you do something, uh, when the government does anything, it costs money. And the government does, there's no such thing as government money. Uh, like the government doesn't have a money tree. Um, every dollar that they spend comes from taxpayers. And so if the government proposes to do something, it's going to cost money. And where's that money going to come from? It's going to come from the taxpayer of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Joe Public. And so um, if, we, if they realized that this was an ineffective way of approaching the issue and a very costly way, then they would not be so keen on the idea. And then what we do try to focus on, as I said, I, we also have a sort of a positive approach to this, um, is there are things uh, that can be done that will have a uh, positive impact on public safety. Um, in some ways, although I'm not usually viewed this way, uh, I'm, I'm actually quite a strong advocate for certain aspects of the Canadian Firearms Program. So, in particular, the idea of screening individuals to make sure that they don't have a criminal background, that they don't have mental health issues, that they don't have uh, a history of being uh, an abuser of, of uh, you know, their spouses or children, uh, that they are not involved in um, extremist activities intended to overthrow uh, the government. Uh, I, we cannot have people uh, advocating the overthrow of a government. There's a way of getting rid of governments we don't like, and that's called the ballot box. Um, and some of us might like to see recourse to that ballot box a little sooner when, when there's a government that we're not fond of. But that's the way that we deal with things, okay, is the ballot box. And so, um, you know, the, what we ha have been focusing on is um, improving how we deal with those issues. So um, uh, with the issues of screening people and so... Uh, you're probably aware that um, uh, our minister, uh, Minister Shandro, was uh, instrumental uh, in pro uh, arranging for us to uh, receive an increase in funding. The federal government has generally not sufficiently funded chief firearms offices across the country. They're almost all understaffed, uh, although now some of the federal ones uh, are, are being uh, beefed up, but the, those resources aren't always flowing through. The federal government is supposed to pay for chief firearms offices, even when they are run by the province. But those funding arrangements are often inadequate, shall we say. So, um, you know, our, our minister has been uh, very proactive in recognizing the value that we have uh, and uh, arranging for us to uh, expand and bring back things that previously had been outsourced outside of the province so that we control things here in Alberta. Uh, I, I think it's, as a general rule, uh, it's a good idea when decisions are based on information on people to uh, have those decisions made as close as possible to where the people and the information is. Uh, and it also ensures that those services are going to be responsive so we believe that what we're doing will provide a faster turnaround to people, so improved customer service uh, and improved uh, not just customer service to uh, people who are uh, bona fide applicants, but also faster follow-up for those cases where something has gone wrong and somebody needs to um, you know, have a license revoked or something like that. that, needs to, that those are issues that do arise, and we need to address those promptly. And so what we've been doing is focusing on, first of all, we try to hire uh, the very best people that we can. Uh, of many of our uh, people who are firearms officers who make decisions on uh, the granting of licenses in, uh, in uh, 
marginal cases, uh, those uh, individuals often uh, have a law enforcement or other investigative background because they have to be skilled at interviewing people, deciding whether, you know, figuring out whether people are telling the truth, uh, deciding what's a flag that they have to follow up on and so on. And then we work at uh, further developing their skills. So uh, we have people come in. We now have a subject matter expert on spousal violence on our staff, um, and she re- helps to review any of the files where there are allegations of, of uh, spousal violence. Um, we have had uh, training on um, issues related to violent extremism, outlaw motorcycle gangs, um, ideologically motivated violent extremism, um, you know, street gangs, that sort of thing. So we're basically taking people who have good investigative and decision-making skills and then providing them with professional development opportunities to make sure that they have um, the very best training to enable them to distinguish that. And, um, uh, I think that's where the that doesn't take a lot of uh, it. Is, uh, you know, a relatively small amount of money can produce as much benefit as you're going to get out of that side of the system, and then that leaves the money that you save if you don't waste it by buying back hundreds of thousands of guns from law-abiding firearms owners. You can use that money for things like uh, better control at the border, uh, following up on, uh, like we need to have much better uh, follow-up on people who have firearms prohibition orders imposed on them. Uh, We need to uh, encourage, we need a little bit, you know, more education in terms of uh, issues around uh, storage and uh, things like that to make sure that their firearms aren't, aren't uh, stolen. Uh, we need to uh, bail reform to make sure that, uh, like, I have no problem with, with uh, you know, somebody who is, I'm not advocating for these activities, but if somebody was a shoplifter, they're probably not a major threat to the community if they're released on bail. But somebody who has three or four times been caught shooting at people on the street, this is not a person who should get out on bail at all. You know, they catch them again, they put them, they should be stuck in, in jail just to keep them from going out and doing the same thing again, because they've demonstrated that that's what they tend to do when they get let loose. So if we uh, stop doing the stupid things like advocating, setting up a massive bureaucracy to go out and uh, take people's property away that they don't want to give up. And, um, you know, every time they go, every time we do that and pay them, every time, a, uh, when I say we, I mean society, if society pays them $1,000 for their gun, it doesn't cost the government $1,000 to give them $1,000. It costs them probably $5,000 to give them $1,000. So if we stop wasting money on all that stupid stuff, then we can actually... Uh, you know, spend the money, small amounts on the regulatory aspects that we deal with here, and then use the larger amounts to address those direct criminal issues, as well as uh, the social causes that result in crime. So, I mean, let's face it, most of the violent incidents involving firearms uh, are driven by illegal activity. Um, So the drug trade or trade in other uh, illegal uh, goods and services, shall we say, whether that's uh, illegal firearms trafficking or trafficking in humans or, or whatever. Um, those are very lucrative activities that people want to, def- the, the crooks want to defend those activities. So that's where a lot of the violence comes. If we could uh, help to um, prevent people from getting involved in drugs, getting involved in gangs, um, help to protect people from uh, from human trafficking uh, and uh, have a better control over those activities. That's where we should be spending money, not on going out and, and you know, taking uh, Uncle George's uh, uh, 
hunting rifle away because it'll hold six rounds, not five. Um, this idea, it's if if it were presented properly to ordinary Canadians, even those who don't have a firearms background, they would very quickly realize how ludicrous it is. But unfortunately, you know, the the federal government is very good at propaganda and all these, you know, inflammatory statements like uh, designed to do such and such and, and, and as quickly wow. as possible. And uh, I mean, it, it makes my skin crawl every time I hear those things, because not only is it false, but it is uh, basically selling snake oil to the Canadian public, uh, trying to convince them that something that will will be an enormous waste of money and uh, a huge uh, bureaucratic boondoggle is going to keep them safe when it won't. And instead, it will actually waste the resources that could have been used to help make people safer. Terry, there is there is so much in there that I that I want to respond to, and I, I'm I'm very um, very happy to, that you're here. That you can I can use you as a reality check, and I'm going to make some assertions. <laughs> and uh, it's so, I, I, there's so much in there, and I want to I want to kind of drill down into a bunch of places. The the first thing when I hear you talking about your so your focus is on I'm going to call it stopping bad guys. I, I don't. I don't like that that phrase, but for, it's a it's a convenient uh, oversimplification for what we're talking about here. Would it one idea that I that I sometimes have is should there be or would it make sense to have two completely different ministries or or, or government departments if we want regulation. You, you you do the, the the good guys go into this bucket and they go under this ministry, the Ministry of Culture, the Ministry of Sport, the Ministry of Defense, something. These are the, the people who get the green the green check mark who go into this bucket. And the, the potential threats go they go under the under the police bucket and they get on the watch list and the, they're the red X's. So you got the green check marks and the red X's. Because what what I the the problem that I see is now with what is happening, putting all of us as potential red X's and confiscating potential, con declaring us this blanket, you know, declaring all of us as potential threats. The result on me is, well, geez, I want to get out of that system. I want to have my guns. I, I want to be unlicensed, unregistered. I want to have all my guns um, without any paperwork uh, and basically opt out of the system. It creates a huge institutional distrust what's happening right now. And, and that, that's bad for you because you're trying to stop bad guys. And now not only bad guys are trying to get out of the system, well, also now good guys, the, the green check mark guys are trying to opt out of the system. What does that mean for your job day to day? Well, first of all, I mean, to a certain extent, we have that now. I mean, people like, like our, um, if you look at the two uh, populations, the population of uh, good guys and gals, um, because of course there's a great many women in this uh, group, including me. So absolutely. Um, um, so I didn't, uh, I didn't mean any offense to anyone. <laughs> no, no, that's a, that's fine. Um, so so um, there's our uh, the people that we deal with are overwhelmingly the good people, okay, and occasionally we have to separate out the bad ones. So it's like, um, you know, you, you have um, uh, a bag of rice and occasionally you find a little pebble in it, okay? Um, whereas the police deal with 99% pebbles and they occasionally have to throw out a grain of rice, <laughs> okay? Um, so, uh, so we have that kind of, of, of thing. But you're right that when the federal government uh, takes measures that target individuals, then they, um, uh, who are perfectly law-abiding, this undermines the confidence in the system. And I, this is something that I have repeatedly said is one of the greater long-term costs. I mean, in the short term, the cost of these kind of measures, uh, like banning specific types of firearms arbitrarily without any justification, um, in the short term, the cost of that is a huge waste of money. Okay. But in the long term, that's even more corrosive 
to our social fabric because it undermines the credibility of the federal government, of the um, of our regulatory system, of the uh, police who are then charged with doing things. I mean, everyone should be thinking of the police as their friends, but not all communities do. And so, um, uh, and I'm, I'm not saying the police are perfect, okay? There are, there are cases where, where there may be some justification for people to have concerns about interacting with them. But by and large, uh, the goal, at least, should be that uh, we should try to do things that encourage trust in our institutions, that encourage trust in our laws, in our parliament, in our judiciary, in our police, in our regulatory system, and and try to avoid things that undermine that uh, that credibility and that trust. And so uh, that I think is one of the the main reasons why it was important for someone like me who has a long history in the firearms community to be appointed to a position like mine because uh, I can deliver messages. I mean, I can tell people um, that, you know, I do believe, yeah, there are errors in this system. And then there's also a good part. And this is the good part. And we should build on that good part rather than throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And so um, uh, in, in what I mean by that specifically is, I mean, it is a good thing that we have a system to uh, screen firearms owners. Uh, and it's a good thing for the general public. And it's also a good thing for the uh, firearms owning community uh, if it is done properly. And the reason for that is it benefits the public as a whole because then they know that, well, I mean, bad guys may be able to get guns illegally by smuggling them or making them or 3D printing them or, or something, but, um, you know, they can have some confidence that uh, a bad guy can't just walk into a gun store and walk out with with uh, some hardware that he wants to have. So, uh, on the one hand, the, uh, the this system provides peace of mind to the general public. Um, and then on the other side, that all that system can also provide um, some comfort to the firearms owning community because it provides them with a way of demonstrating that they are the good guys and gals. Uh, that that pal that they have shows, yes, you see, this is a proof that I'm a law-abiding person. Okay, and that's why it's so important that we make sure that no no bad people get through that system. Um, and that's why I focus so much on, on the selection and the training of our staff to make sure that they're able to make good decisions about those things. And, and they work very hard at that. And I know every one of them takes that responsibility very seriously. And, um, you know, if anything doesn't develop the way that they uh, they think when they make a decision, they are devastated by that. It's a, it's a very, this is a very responsible job. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're expanding. And, you know, we posted our first 10 jobs. We got over 300 applications. Um, it's a, the feds don't generally get that kind of a ratio, but we're perceived as a, as a, a good place to work. But, it's, it's not just a place, I mean, a lot of our people here, not all of them, but a lot of our people here are firearms enthusiasts, but this is not a job where where it's like a fun t thing of like, oh, I get to handle guns and see neat stuff all day. Um, you know, a lot of what our firearms officers do is very demanding. It's very trying because they have to, uh, when we review, when we review uh, revoke or refuse somebody's license, they have to look at evidence about that person's behavior that could be very disturbing. Um, and can you give and, can you give an example without obviously without any kind of violating any privacy? But what types yeah, of stuff? Sure. So so someone might apply for a job and then or not a job, but they, they might apply for a, a pal. Okay, and it turns out that there is a history of spousal abuse or uh, other violence or. 
uh, child sexual abuse. And uh, in order to be able to make a decision and document it in a way that will stand up in court, because everybody has a, a right to request a reference hearing if they feel they've been hard done by, by a decision that we have made, our officers have to review all that evidence uh, about some of the very nastiest aspects of human behavior. So um, it's, it's a very tough job. And I don't think people realize or give them credit for how, how hard that is. Um, you know, because we're always thinking of only the good guys. But remember, our job is to, pr uh, to root out the infiltrators, the people who would try to worm their way into the system and, and get a firearms license as a way of uh, obtaining access to things that uh, they shouldn't have. And so that means that, um, you know, although, uh, to use my former analogy, although 99.5% of our stuff may be, uh, may be rice, there is a pebble in there. Uh, and that, you know, a, a pebble in your shoe or in your, in your mouth full of food can be quite annoying. And uh, uh, so we, we, um, uh, we focus very much on separating the, the rice from the pebbles. And, um, and those few pebbles that we do encounter can really stick in people's minds. And I know that that, that does cause them to lose sleep sometimes. And I also just want to uh, to get concrete here on that example that you used to make sure I'm understanding correctly. In the case of the domestic abuse or the um, or the, the the sexual abuse, is is there concern there that the person would want to buy a firearm to protect themselves or use it against the perpetrator or perhaps on themselves? Is that is that the risk? Uh, well, actually, what we're talking about uh, mostly in those cases where we're having to review the evidence uh, is. Um, someone who might be a, an abuser and wants to get a gun so that they can up the ante and instead mm. of just um, um, intimidating their partner with their fists, intimidate them with a gun. Okay. And So it would uh, usually you know, be the, the, the aggressor that would see, you'd be usually faced with the aggressor wanting a firearm as opposed to the, yes. Yes. the, the target. Yeah. Uh, yes. I okay. mean, the other situation does arise. Uh, that's a that's a more difficult situation because um, under under the law, uh, if it, if we can't issue a license if the person is going to be a risk to anyone, right? Okay, and that includes taking the law into their own hands in cases where they may have been uh, a victim. So, okay. right. um, you know, that's a that's a moral dilemma, but. Um, you know, that's what the law is that we have to work with. Uh, but the, that's that's quite a, a rare case. The, the, the majority of cases uh, are people who uh, that we have to, to refuse. Um, and there's not a lot, you know, because the, the majority of people know that they're going to get screened. But you'd be surprised. I mean, we you'll have people who are open gang members who will submit an application. What the hell? Might as well give it a whirl and see if they can get through. And you know, they don't. More often, they'll they'll get someone they know, like a girlfriend or something, to to uh, uh, apply, and that's a little harder to detect. But we work on all of these things, and we collaborate. Um, you know, and it's important, as I say, not just to general public safety, but it's important to the firearms community that we keep ourselves pure. That that when, uh, like, if you're at a gun show and and somebody shows you their pal that you know, yeah, this is a good person because they've got a pal. And, of course, now we do have to verify that through a, uh, through a system because, again, there were people who were counterfeiting pals and, and stealing pals and, and uh, you know, using those to illegally acquire firearms. Uh, but, you know, a pal should be assigned to people that, yeah, I've, and it should be something that people are proud of that, see, I've undergone this training. I've undergone screening. Uh, I am one of the good people. I am one of the good guys or the good gals. I, I'm, I'm, I'm the what I want to respond to that is yeah. And what's happening is now having a pal. I feel like a sucker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if I didn't have a pal and I had my guns, I'd get to keep my guns. By having a pal, I risk losing them. So actually, pal well, is a sign that I'm a sucker. 
Well, I would actually flip that on its head. You're a sucker if you believe that. Because if you own a bunch of guns illegally, sooner or later that's going to come out. Because if you if you own your guns uh, and what, what are you going to do with them then? Okay, every you've got to use I haven't, them. I haven't thought that far forward. So, yeah, if you're if you're going to use your guns, you're yeah. going to have to take them to the range. You're going to have to go out hunting. Then it's going to be obvious that you know yeah. that you don't have a license. You're going to get caught. Penalties for that are severe. So uh, the idea so it, that, yeah. but but where people what it does mean uh, what the way you do see this behavior um, or this concern acting out. Sometimes people do just leave the firearms community. Uh, I've seen many people actually moving south of the border if that's an option for them. Um, you know, they've, they've I've had people just come up and say, "I've had enough of this. I'm I've I've got a vacation home in Arizona. I'm gonna I'm gonna move my stuff there and and spend my time where it's warm." Um, or, um, you know, as I mentioned, just uh, sell out of of the uh, of the community or. Um, go for things that are rated lower. Okay. So, uh, instead of having restricted firearms, going for non-restricted firearms, uh, or instead of having non-restricted firearms, going for antiques, uh, you've seen that, um, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's amazing to me that junky antique handguns that, you know, 20 years ago would have sold for $50 are now $5,000. Uh, because people are just prepared to, uh, they, they just want something that the government can't take away because they don't know it's there. Um, but I, I don't, is that I don't, quite I rare? I would, I'm imagining I, that's quite rare. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure what you mean by rare. There are, if you look at the prices of of handguns that actually qualify for antiques, antique status. They have escalated enormously, okay. and a lot of people have said that's you know that they're going that way. There's only a, there's only so many of those around, so uh, it's not a, an avenue for everybody. But it is it's a sign to me that people don't trust the system, yeah. and um, that's something I think very much to be regretted, uh, it, both with respect to firearms, but just. It's a sign of what's going on in our society when people don't trust our institutions. And so we need to be working hard to make sure that our institutions work for people in the sense of delivering results, um, of being efficient, of being effective, uh, and of being trustworthy. And so, um, you know, when we uh, our whole focus in our office. What I, one of my, I'm, I'm always coming up with pithy little slogans and so on. So one of my slogans is, is uh, compliance through credibility, not compulsion. So mm -hmm. if we have laws that are credible, that are reasonable, and they are uh, being administered by people who are credible and reasonable, then it's a natural human tendency to want to comply, to just go along with things, and uh, and everyone will be better off that way. Uh, but if we uh, follow the path that the federal government has followed uh, and try and uh, abuse the most honest, law-abiding segment of the population, um, then that undermines people's trust in the whole system, not just gun control, but every aspect of uh, of how we operate our society. I mean, you know, many people, and sometimes even me, myself, uh, we, we rail against, well, you know, the government, what do we need government for? But, I mean, in a modern society and big with, you know, big cities and large population centers and so on, we need to have a government. I mean, if somebody needs to, you know, build roads and plow the streets and, and uh, uh you know, ensure that that uh, uh, the services that we need to have a, a modern society are there for people. But that government needs to be uh, run in a fashion that is efficient and effective and respectful of people. Um, and I believe that is possible, but it in, but it is not going to happen by itself. It means that people have to step up. I mean, one I never thought of either government or politics as 
honorable professions, to tell you the truth, for a long time. But then I realized that if if I didn't believe that, uh, if I well, if I believed that uh, these were not honorable professions, then it was only dishonorable people who were going to be in them, and that would be a self fulfilling prophecy. So people who uh, who believe in efficiency, who believe in effectiveness, who believe in trustworthiness, have to put themselves forward to serve in these kind of jobs. I mean, this is not what I expected to be doing when I retired. How far you've company. fallen, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it's not what I expected to be doing when I retired in 2015. What I expected to be doing now was uh, translating old Japanese military manuals uh, and administering a museum. Uh, is what I expected to be doing by now when I retired in twenty from the university in twenty fifteen. How close are you to that? To to doing uh, that? Well, I don't I don't know, but the distance would be measured in light years. Okay. Uh, there there is one thing also. There's one step further that I that I'd like to go in what you're saying, and and I believe besides the the distrust, I I, I totally agree that and I, I experienced that that distrust and the decredibilization of the, the people you mentioned, the politicians, the police, the institutions, the the Canadian firearms program, and so forth. And I think the that the step I want to take is to see that actually creates a public safety risk when. The, when the politicians use the type of language that that they have, this kind of that that you know these people they have their guns to hurt people like that, and and the the, the it's very poetic, it's very psychologically effective, mm -hmm. and if you're one of the people who owns one of those products and you hear the prime minister describe you as having those intentions, it's frustrating and it's angering, and you have I believe I I, I believe that if the protests. Um, and some people want to go beyond protesting. They, they don't just want a change of government with ballots. Some people may want a change of government with bullets. And I think that creates, a instead of a theoretical something or other, you have an, all of a sudden you have a real public safety risk. And that, I think, is terrible for, for obviously, for social stability, for political stability. Um, and I just wanted to, to say that as uh, how this whole thing can backfire. Well, it, it backfires in a number of ways. And I mean, that's... Uh, that's sort of the most uh, extreme way, yeah. but um, you know, it, it also means that uh, it results in a polarization. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I think the number of people, realistically, the number of people who will progress to actually promoting or uh, encouraging or adopting uh, violence as a form of social change. Uh, is relatively small, fortunately. Um, not to say that it doesn't deserve attention, and there there are a surprising number of resources actually dedicated to uh, to that. Um, but uh, I think it also just by polarizing society and demonizing certain groups uh, that is. Um, it has a detrimental effect on all of our our um, body politic, to use an old-fashioned expression, um, because we need to be able to work together. Um, we need to be able to have uh, discussions about difficult issues without people being uh, immediately condemned as um, I, either... Uh, uh, racists or communists or, you know, it would choose some kind of inflammatory term. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to avoid those, although I'm not always <laughs> uh, successful. I'm, I'm human like everyone else. Um, but, um, you know, we, ne we need to um, have uh, pre preserve uh, a middle ground where we can uh, discuss these issues reasonably, and when governments go beyond what anyone could reasonably perceive as a legitimate uh, uh, form of uh, regulating personal activities, then uh, that tends to pull people apart. You know, and when you have people using rhetoric like, oh, well, you know, the only reason for having these is to do something bad. Uh, well, the people who own them say, well, I'm not doing anything bad. So clearly you are uh, uh, speaking nonsense. 
And then the people on the other side are saying, well, those people have those things, so they must be planning on doing something bad. That's a really just a, a negative and destructive and corrosive thing for our society. And uh, I really wish that the federal government would stop doing that and would um, engage in some uh, some honest consultation. Um, and I've, I'm, I'm not afraid of honest consultation. I'm not afraid of uh, looking at, at the facts on issues because I believe the facts will favor, by and large, the things that I, uh, I am advocating because I formed those views based on facts. Remember, I spent 25 years as an academic and to a large extent determining what studies and data mean. And uh, a great many studies don't mean what they purport to mean or what they are reported to mean, which is every time you, there, there's one thing is what the study means. There's another thing is what it's, what it's presented by its authors as meaning. And then there's even further from the truth is what uh, reporters and then politicians present those studies as demonstrating. Uh, and and I'm not just talking about firearms issues, but in, in general, um, we need to probably do a better job of uh, educating people on, uh, on how to interpret evidence and logic. Um, you know, when I was a, a professor, I, I, most of my classes, I incorporated debates. And uh, these were on business topics, not, not firearms control. But um, uh, I would usually encourage people to take the position uh, and argue in the debate for the position that was opposite to what they initially started with. Like if they initially thought, oh, yeah, we should have completely free trade uh, and somebody else says, no, we should have no trade at all. Well, swap positions, try and argue that and it will help you to understand another point of view. Um, and so. Uh, you know, one of the ways that I, I learn a lot is uh, we do, the overwhelming majority of the letters and emails and things we get are supportive of the work that we do, but we do get some that are, are critical. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been accused of, well, you're arguing for unfettered access to firearms, which is, of course, the furthest thing from the truth. But then that enables me to see, okay, how do I need to adjust my message to make sure that people get that uh, message. And it's, it is difficult when, um, like when I do a media interview, I might be interviewed for half an hour and they use two 10 second clips out of that. And so uh, I may talk for 29 and a half minutes about the work that we're doing on public safety and 30 seconds about our opposition to some of the crazy ideas coming out of Ottawa. But what will make headlines is the 30 seconds I talked about the crazy things that are coming out of Ottawa yeah. and not the rather, uh, you know, the 29 and a half minutes I spent talking about what we're doing on public safety because public safety work is real public safety work, not, you know, propagandistic sensationalistic statements um, to which certain federal politicians who shall remain unnamed are, are prone. Um, but the real public safety work is not exciting. It's detailed. It's, um, it's the kind of thing that uh, if, there were, um, any, if there were any reporting of it at all, it would be buried on you know, the back of page 35 of section F of, <laughs> of the newspaper. If they, I have to check, do they still publish newspapers anymore? <laughs> well, that's that's actually part of the reason I created the gun blog in 2015 was because my experience as a as a, as a recreational pal holder was not reflected in the media, and I thought, well, geez, there's a lot that happens, like like this the work that you're doing. You didn't you weren't in your post at the time, but the the work that that is being done by regulators and investigators and and so forth and that just didn't get reflected. And that's why we're, we're having, we've been talking now for, for 50 minutes or so 
it's going to be on, it's going to be posted all 50 minutes. I'm not just going to clip a soundbite. I may clip a soundbite for one reason, but they're, they're will, they will have access. The audience, the listeners and watchers will be able to watch this whole thing. Yeah, it just, um, I understand that. And having been in that business, I understand they will clip the the stuff with the drama and the tension and the fight for that, that sexy headline. Mm-hmm. And public yeah. safety, it, like investigating file cases and preparing evidence is not is not attractive, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, I mean, just to give you an example, um, you know, when we, uh, as I mentioned, if we refuse someone a license or if we revoke someone's license, uh, they can take, a, can ask for a reference hearing and uh, they have that right. And then we have to go to court in order to, um, to um, uh, demonstrate that our decision was reasonable. Okay, that's the standard actually in this. It's it's reasonable. It's we we don't have to prove that uh, we were correct beyond a reasonable doubt because, um, well, that's the standard that's been established in the court. So, uh, you know, my firearms officers take that very very seriously, and they are prepping night and day and and so on. To, because they know they're going to be up on the stand. They're going to have to justify everything that they did, every word that they said, every note that they made, every uh, piece of correspondence that they sent. So, you know, these are tough jobs. And uh, I really have to, um, to commend the people that I have on my staff who do this with uh, just such incredible professionalism. Uh, and... Uh, and there are people who are doing that in in other uh, areas. I think we do a better job in Alberta, but um, but you know there are people in these chief firearms offices all across the country who are kind of the unsung heroes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I know that it's it's always easy. You know, occasionally there is conflict between uh, a chief firearms office and uh, someone, an individual or a club or a range or, or something. But by and large, these are people who are who are doing their best. They're, they don't all have the same kind of background as me. Each person brings something unique to the, to the table. Um, but they are doing uh, important work, um, and uh, I don't think they get enough credit for that. Have you met all the CFOs in Canada? Um, in principle, yes. Um, so uh, we have twice a year now. It was once a year, but this being stepped up to twice a year. Uh, we have conferences. Uh, and so um, the last one was held in Ottawa at RCMP headquarters because uh, the Canadian Firearms Program is part of, um, was is run by the RCMP. Um, so... Uh, and previous, uh, previously we had one in Winnipeg, and so now we're going to be sort of alternating, having one in Ottawa, and then six months later one in one of the other places. So apart from turnover, um, you know, because there's occasionally people retire or, or move on to other things or or whatever, I, I have met them. In fact, uh, occasionally I run into one of the other ones here because um, we. Um, so the Chief Firearms Office in Alberta used to be responsible for the Northwest Territories. Right. When we went provincial, the uh, Northwest Territories had to be split off because our province can't be administering a federal territory. Um, so there are actually in our building two Chief Firearms Offices, the one that I run for Alberta and the one that someone else runs for the Northwest Territories. So occasionally I run into her in the elevator. That's, that's <laughs> convenient. And, and question though, the views that you're sharing with me right now today, would you say your your peers, your counterparts in other provinces and regions or, or, and territories, would they agree with what you're saying? Or do you have some kind of far out Alberta view that they would not agree with? Well, I can't speak for them. Right, I wouldn't, but pur- wouldn't purport just, to. Just your, just your impression, but, though. Just your but, impression, yeah. Well, I, I am going to say something. So I have to preface. That was my preface, <laughs> okay. okay, that I can't actually speak for them. Certain aspects uh, of what I've said, I think, would be almost universally shared. For example, the importance of the work done by firearms officers, uh, the need for more uh, resources, the... Um, uh, uh, 
the fact that the overwhelming majority of firearms owners are uh, law-abiding, those, are, I think, are relatively uncontroversial points. Um, you know, you get two people, and, and sometimes there, there are people, sometimes you can have people who, um, they want to agree so completely that they find ways to argue over minor details. But, uh, but by and large, those kind of things, I think there would be a, a broad consensus on. Um, but other areas, um, you know, for example, on the role of the firearms prohibitions and things like that, um, I would say it's probably not as universal because most of them don't think about that that much they because it's not part of their job remember that my mandate is kind of unique and uh, along with that of uh, CFO Freeberg in Saskatchewan in that we are supposed to we're explicitly directed by our ministers uh, the ministers that we report to to look at the program see whether it makes sense and make recommendations to um, improve the the program uh, and of course, it's a that's a little bit of an interesting mandate because we're making recommendations, but we don't have the ability to do that because it's a federal program. So I can say I, I'm mandated to say what the direction that I think the program uh, and the and the gun control regime in general should go in, but it's not my it's not within my power to move it in that direction because the firearms legislation is primarily federal. Uh, and so um, so they don't, most of them, they might think, oh, there's another cockamamie idea coming out of Ottawa, but they, they, they don't go much, not all of them would go much beyond that because it's not an explicit part of their job the way it is for me. But, you know, uh, I know that all the chief firearms officers across the country take their responsibility for public safety very seriously. They do the best that they can under the circumstances. Um, they come from widely different backgrounds. Um, there are some who are former police officers, but there are others who have other kinds of backgrounds. Uh, and so, uh, so I'm, I'm, I think I'm the only one who's actually a former professor, uh, but they, they were, some of them were in other areas of the federal, uh, federal government prior to taking that position. And if you had to guess at how many are, I'm going to, how many you'd label pro-gun, how many you'd label anti-gun, what would the split be? Well, I, I don't, uh, I, I wouldn't actually split it that way because I think everyone who's in this program uh, would say that they are uh, in favor of fair treatment of law-abiding firearms owners, um, and they are in favor of uh, dealing severely with non-law-abiding abusers of firearms. Um, but uh, where people where people fall on issues of uh, what types of activities are are uh, legitimate and so on. I mean, even amongst gun owners, there's uh, there is some uh, heterogeneity on that score because you know there are the people who say, well, yeah, my over and under that I use for trap shooting is uh, is fine, but uh, that guy has a pump action shotgun and and he should be using an over under, you know. Uh, uh, or, you know, you, you, I'm sure you're aware uh, of the, the various uh, splits that happen even within the firearms community. My gun's so, good, your gun's bad. Uh, yeah. So well, it's sort of like what I always say about driving. You know, there's only two kinds of drivers. There's the, there's the idiots who drive slower than me and the maniacs who drive faster than me. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> it's... Uh, yeah. Okay. So I'm getting that the the because I've heard a lot of stories about about CFOs and of course CFOs change, but um, I, I've heard some stories about certain provinces that seem to have a tendency for being, uh, if not anti-gun, um, uh, uh, suppressive or not in, um, really try to limit and and saying no a lot more than they say yes. Well, um, you know, to, to this, and I should rephrase yeah. that. Um, 
yeah, I'll call it anti-gun. Have an seem to have the have, seem to be um, by the people I'm speaking to seem to be quite anti-gun. Well, I think uh, I'm, uh, what I would say really is, anytime there's a law or a regulation or some kind of a rule, you can um, try to find ways to uh, use that rule against people or use that rule to help people. Um, so, you know, for example, we always try um, we always try to bring people into compliance to help them to comply, to avoid um, issues. We never, you know, we, we actively work to try and help ranges to stay open, to uh, help people to keep their guns, uh, you know, to make sure that they get a proper license uh, and, and so on. Um, if we have to, then, you know, if somebody has done something that, uh, clearly makes them unsuitable for firearms ownership. Well, yeah, we're going to revoke their license, and and that's part of uh, you know when you uh, apply for a firearms license, you know that if you do certain things, that they'll take it away. Right. And um, unfortunately, you know that's we don't have to do that very often, but unfortunately, it is part of the job. Um, and uh, you know, I mean. Uh, Personally, I have uh, I have um, spent a lot of money on security at my home because part of my job is through my officers to identify people who are too crazy to have guns, and then to make them angry by taking their license away. So, you know, what, I'd like to. Uh, this is fascinating. I mean, what, what, I'd like to get into the um, to come back to something you were saying just a moment ago. Also in terms of your being asked to comment on policy and what makes sense and what doesn't, how closely the, um, are you, how closely do you work with the, I assume ministry, minister of justice, um, and attorney, attorney general on, on the firearm issues? Like, are, do they, do they consult you? Do you, are you on the phone with them 10 times a day? Is it like that? Can you give some flavor about the relationship there? Well, it's a very good, positive uh, working relationship. Um, you know, um, in particular, uh, you know, Minister Shandro has been a strong um, supporter of the firearms community. Very vocal, um, yeah. Very vocal and, and very strong supporter, yeah. Yes. And uh, as has been our premier, uh, the former premier and this premier have both been very supportive. Um, so uh, I guess uh, as you descend, the hierarchy, uh, then I have more contact. So I've met the premier a couple of times. Uh, I've met the minister uh, many more times than that. Um, and But I communicate with his chief of staff even more than that. So, you know, it sort of depends. Obviously, the premier has a lot of other things on her plate. So does the minister. Uh, firearms are only one of the rules for which he's uh, responsible. Um, so it's not multiple times a day, um, but it also goes a little bit in, in flurries. So there are times when I may uh, exchange messages multiple times in one day on something because there's something that's particularly active at that moment, and it might not be for a while. Um, as to my role in things, um, it's sort of like a, a, a subject matter expert. So for example, when, if something is being drafted, they'll contact me and say, like, does this make sense? Or, you know, have we used the right language? Or, um, you know, how should we approach this issue? So uh, I, I do get asked for input on uh, issues related to firearms, which is a role that in general is not part of uh, the normal responsibilities, the narrowly defined responsibilities of a chief firearms officer. But when I was appointed, I had a mandate letter which laid out much more expansive responsibilities than is typical for especially a federally appointed CFO because uh, their job is basically, here's the program, we'll tell you what to do. Uh, whereas uh, my job is uh, to administer the program as it is now, but to try and 
uh, advocate for change to make it better, to make it more effective, to make it more efficient, uh, to make it more user friendly, um, to um, to help to uh, reconcile the two issues, which I think are uh, are actually complementary and mutually reinforcing, and that is a flourishing firearms community and the very highest levels of public safety. Are you, um, how closely are you working on the Alberta Firearms Act that's being drafted? Uh, and, and I, yeah, I guess, what can you say about, in terms of the timing also, I believe Premier Smith said, if UCP wins the election in five-ish months, then they will propose this Alberta Firearms Act. What can you say about, about what's going on there? Uh, well, the election is May 29th, so okay. that, that does give you a, I believe that that's, I, I'm not an expert on provincial politics. So believe it or months, not, four, four although months. I'm now a provincial employee, I never really had much involvement in provincial politics <laughs> before. I, I always had more interest in federal politics because the issues that I was interested in both professionally and personally tend to be under federal jurisdiction. Uh, but um, so May 29th is the election. Uh, I think it is highly likely that there will be something uh, introduced before then. Uh, I am uh, consulted on that on a frequent basis, but I can't say uh, exactly um, what or when or what the content of anything would be because that's confidential until it is revealed in the legislature. I understand. Okay. And with regards to what is happening in Ottawa, and I'm talking about Bill C-21, the mass confiscations, there's the, just to recap, in May 2020, there was the order in council with the first wave of rifle and shotgun confiscations ordered. Then there was last year, the order in council to prohibit handgun buying, selling transfers, and then begin handgun confiscations. And then Bill C-21, the, the amendment in November, which expanded the May 2020 order in council with this, va well, proposed to ex propose this huge mass confiscation. How do you see, and, and Alberta has said, the, the Minister of Alberta, the, the Minister of Justice, and you, with, with, with you at his side, have said, you're fighting this, you're adding, you're boosting up legal measures, you're uh, guiding or asking prosecutors to, to not prosecute people just for not surrendering their firearms to the confiscations. When you think forward about a likely scenario, what do you see? Um, well, I guess what I would what I would say is first of all what we're doing. So, uh, on the one hand, um, the the premier, the minister, and myself have spoken out against the measures that the federal government is announcing. So we can advocate against those measures. Okay. Um, Given previous Supreme Court and other decisions about where jurisdiction lies, we can't overrule what the feds choose to do. Um, it's my understanding. I'm not a lawyer, okay, or a constitutional expert, uh, but I believe that it's not within our power to overrule what they do. But we can argue against it until it is until they do something. Uh, we can also uh, ensure that um, whatever they do uh, is within their jurisdiction and doesn't exceed and infringe onto provincial jurisdiction. And that's a, there's, this is one of many matters where uh, there's a tendency for jurisdiction to be primarily on one side or the other, but there is some overlap. So we need to draw a clear demarcation there. Uh, and then we can also uh, hopefully ensure that whatever uh, measures the federal government uh, does enact, uh, whether they respond to our protestations or not, uh, that they do so in a manner that uh, respects the property rights and uh, other rights of uh, Albertans. So... Um, there's a variety of ways uh, that we are responding. Um, 
And now, to be honest, I've I've rattled on long enough. I can't remember what the second part of your question was. Just were, these confis. So um, the, 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 the liberals want to confiscate. Alberta is yeah. saying no. What what's yeah. a like? If I'm an Alberta gun owner who owns some of the firearms that are, uh, I'm targeted by these confiscations. Yeah. And what's the what's my likely? Um, what should I do if I'm an Alberta gun owner targeted by these uh, federal measures? Well, right now, uh, I would say there's two things that you should do. So first, all, first off is sit tight and don't panic, okay? Because uh, right now, we're almost at the end of January. The current amnesty expires at the end of October. October, I think it's October 30th, so technically not quite the end of October. Yeah. Um, but um, given where the federal government is right now, on developing its process for the confiscation of these firearms and the awarding of some degree of compensation to affected individuals, I can't see any way that it's possible for them to accomplish that program by the date of the, uh, the amnesty uh, expires. So I have no inside information on that. Uh, as I've as I'm fond of saying, neither Justin Trudeau nor Minister Mendocino whispers sweet nothings into my ear. Um, I don't get any inside information on that. If anything, they would probably rip my ear off. Uh, but um, figuratively, of course, because neither of them, I'm sure, would want to engage in any actual uh, act of violence. Um, but... <laughs> well, yeah. uh, but... Um, uh, Anyway, they, uh, there's no way that they can do what they are proposing to do. I think they will have no alternative but to uh, reluctantly um, extend the amnesty. Uh, I imagine they will try and uh, do some face saving by talking about all of the work that they have done to lay the groundwork for, um, for carrying out these measures, even if... In fact, by that time, very little has been accomplished. Um, but uh, that's what I predict, is that the federal government will end up... Um, it's a prediction, okay? It's not... I don't have control over this. I don't have the inside information. But my reading of the situation is that they will end up um, responding uh, reluctantly to the calls that uh, our minister and myself and many others have made for them to extend the amnesty as the very least that they can do. Um, my hope would be that during that extended period, they would recognize the folly of their ways, uh, but I don't hold a great hope for that. I think they will continue to advocate for it right to the bitter end. But as you're probably aware, there are a number of regulations that have been delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed for many, many years. The most Notorious case probably being the, the uh, firearms import marking regulations. Um, so um, I would sit tight, don't panic. Um, but the other thing is, and this is a, a more general point, um, you know, someone once said that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Uh, and the, I don't know, I don't recall who it was, but it's a nif one of those nifty sounding quotes that you hear every once in a while. Uh, and for firearms owners, owners, what that means is the battle is always on, okay? It may be heated up at some point, but it's always on. We always need to be doing several things. We need, uh, on a personal level, to always be on our best behavior, to be putting our best foot forward, to be demonstrating the highest levels of personal accountability, of safety, of responsibility, um, and, um, and being, uh, you know, responsible in both our words and actions. Uh, so not getting too, uh, I, this is hard to do sometimes. I know I, I'm afflicted by, uh, what I jokingly refer to as teleyelitis, where I, when I hear certain things on the TV, I start yelling at it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, much to the amusement of my husband, um, but, you know, we, we have to be responsible for uh, how we express ourselves in public uh, and not say, you know, uh, inflammatory uh, things. Uh, so I think that's one uh, aspect. 
The other aspect, I think, is uh, a more proactive one. Uh, and I always, when people say, well, what can I do? I always say three things. And those three things are join, donate, volunteer. Join organizations, whether firearms organizations or political parties, that uh, support your uh, continued ability to uh, own and responsibly use firearms. Uh, then donate to them because the, uh, the membership fees for firearms organizations or for political parties, even more so, bar barely even cover their communications costs. So, you know, typically party memberships are like $10 or $15 or something. Well, it costs them more than that just to keep you on the rolls. So, um, and similarly with firearms organizations, they usually have more extensive communications and they, you know, their fees may be 40 or $45 or $50 or a year or something. I mean, nowadays, $50 is nothing, um, especially with the inflation that's going on right now. So, so donate. Um, and what I, the, the rule of thumb that I have used for a long time and that I personally have exceeded for many years is every firearms owner every year should donate the equivalent of the cost of one typical firearm that they would have. So if you are a person of modest means and you buy $400 firearms, you should contribute $400 a year. If you're a wealthier person and you like those $50,000, you know, custom engraved uh, double rifles or something like that, then you should be putting in $50,000 a year. You can't donate that much to a political party because there are limits, uh, about $1,700 a year federally for uh, political contributions, although you can give to both a political party and to a, uh, a um, uh, your local constituency association. Um, so that's not tax advice, okay? I'm not a licensed tax lawyer, just my, my basic understanding of things. Um, but third... And most importantly, and even if your budget is tight and you can't donate, volunteer, okay? Uh, volunteer with either firearms organizations or probably even more importantly, political parties and politicians uh, at either the provincial or federal level or both. And so um, this is how you will gain access and credibility when you're speaking to politicians. If you have been working on the campaign team of uh, an M a member of a provincial legislature, whatever they're called, MPPs or MLAs, or depending on your jurisdiction, uh, or your federal member of parliament, they're going to be they're going to make time for you when you want to talk to them, and they're going to listen to what you have to say, because all politicians need people. Uh, particularly, not only at election time, but especially at election time. And they need all kinds of people. They need people who are good at computers. They need people who can talk on the phone. They need people who can just walk around and deliver brochures. People who are good with their hands to, to build campaign signs. Uh, you know, they need all kinds of things to help them stay in their positions. And the more that you can do to help those uh, political figures, the, first of all, they're going to be positively inclined to you because they're going to see, hey, that, that person is here, you know, uh, every night they're here uh, during the campaign, working until 10 o'clock, helping me to get reelected. So, um, and, you know, you when you're in that kind of a role, you don't want to be sort of too overt. You let people know, yeah, I joined because I'm a firearms owner and I... I think that you're a pro, a good politician and I want to get you elected. You don't have to preach that every day. You know, when I've been involved with, uh, with campaigns, I seldom talked about that issue. What I was there for was to help that person get reelected. And afterwards, if I want to talk to them, then they're going to listen to me. And so, um, you know, people need to be doing this, not just when, when we're under active attack, but, Given the trends in Canadian society where more and more of the population lives in large metropolitan areas, has no direct personal exposure to firearms, uh, the more 
we're going to have to, to uh, be active to get our voice out there because people won't, uh, as part of their normal lives, uh, develop the understanding of us that we need them to have. And so we need to be active all the time. And I know people would say, oh, well, I don't like politics. I don't want to get involved. I just, I just want to go out and shoot. You know, I like shooting gophers or I like busting clay targets or, uh, you know, I, I like uh, putting on my six guns and doing cowboy action shooting or whatever. I, I don't want to be out doing those other things. Well, one is the price of the other. Okay. Uh, and, um, you know, no, nobody, nobody likes, um, uh, you know, vacuuming the house and so on, but it's got to be done uh, if you want to continue to live there. So uh, it's part of the responsibilities that you, uh, that everyone needs to accept. Oh, I'm not hearing you. Thank you. That's because I muted myself while I coughed. I, I wholeheartedly support uh, what you what you just said, and um, and I'm also going to just a plug for myself here. The Gunblog.ca is a if uh, if every person who visited the website donated one dollar, the 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 reach and the expansion that we could do is just much much bigger. So I encourage people to uh, subscribe or donate what what they can to help keep the gun blog strong and free. I also want to come back to this. Your second point about um, you made this actually. I was rewatching your Bill C seventy one testimony to the Senate. I was rewatching the video yesterday, and you talked about. I'm going to paraphrase here, but our our friends, our families, our colleagues, our kids, grandkids, nephews, nieces, the people around us are learning about gun culture, and we have a choice. Either they learn about it from video games and Hollywood and the media or they learn about it from us. So when you're talking about the political engagement and the, the, the one being the price of the other, that engagement should include sharing our gun culture, the responsible, uh, wholesome, honest, fun, educational and so forth, uh, the community, that engagement. What I'm trying to say is we also, besides the political engagement, we also have kind of a cultural engagement with regards to the people around us, our families, friends, okay. colleagues, neighbors. Yes. Well, you know, uh, as I, as I um, and you, I thought you made that point much more eloquently in your in your testimony. Yes. Well, um, thank you. Um, uh, it's it's interesting. I I uh, you you're probably more familiar with what I said then than I am because I've been too busy to look at it again. Uh, but um, it it is true, and it's a point that I've often made um, when speaking on this topic is that. Um, all of the aspects of the firearms community, whether it's the gun show circuit or uh, people who are actively involved in, in a target shooting competition or um, hunters or, um, you know, whatever the, the collectors organizations, things like that. These uh and the people who volunteer their time to maintain the ranges, I mean, ranges take a, a lot of work to, to stay up to standard and to remain safe. Um, all of these people are the ones who are, um, who, who we should be, society should be relying on to create a positive gun culture. Uh, all societies have a gun culture of one kind or another. That's just how society views firearms. And are they going to view firearms as a, um, as a, uh, a tool that is used for uh, a variety of purposes, um, whether that be economic purposes like predator control on ranches or purely recreational activities like busting clay targets. Um, you know, uh, the society needs to uh, have the attitudes shaped by these kinds of groups, by target shooters, by collectors, by hunters, and not by, as you've uh, mentioned, video games and and uh, uh, and sensationalistic news coverage and, uh, and violent movies and 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 so on. Um, and if we, if the federal government continues in these relentless attacks on the firearms community, then they will eventually eliminate the positive influence of 
the firearms community, and all there will be creating attitudes towards firearms, is those negative aspects. And that, I think, would be a tremendous disservice to the public at large and to Canada. So we all need to be actively involved uh, in our communities, in our uh, political organizations, in the, the, uh, the life of our uh, families and communities, and be a good example for all of them. Um, be uh, moderate, be responsible, be um, safety-oriented, and, um, you know, part of, part of the, the thing, uh, one of my... Uh, my member of parliament's wife said something very interesting in the, one of the recent election campaigns. She actually wrote it on the, on the whiteboard in the, in the campaign office. She said, just because you don't take an interest in politics doesn't mean politics won't take an interest in you. Uh, and so, um, you know, and, and what you will find, uh, to be fair on that, is that if you do get involved politically, you're going to meet lots of other people from your community and discover that not only is it an opportunity for you to influence them, but you will find out more about your community and about other people. Mm -hmm. And you will realize that there are other good people in the community who have, who are public interested. They may not be interested in your issue in particular, but they, they are, um, <coughs> excuse me, there's a tremendous, uh, resource that we have in Canada of good-hearted people who need to stand up and uh, advance the good causes. And it's not just ours, our causes. It, it looks like that message is, is touching something very personal for you. And I want to acknowledge that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no. I get a little bit worked up about these things. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, you know, that's, that's the, the passion that drives me. That makes me work seven days a week. That makes me, uh, always putting myself out there in order to stand up for all kinds of good causes. I thought I was doing pretty well because usually I, I get wound up enough to, to, um, uh, to be emotionally affected well before this point in, in, uh, in a discussion, but, uh, Anyway, I, I thank you for your indulgence. I, I, Travis Bader of the Silver Court podcast, we did a podcast uh, just over a year ago, and I just bawled talking about <laughs> some personal issue at the time. So it's, I, I, yeah, and so you're, you're in absolutely um, good company here. Um, and you, and I'd like to, um, just as we wind down here, I'd like, since it's, it's a good segue, actually, it's a perfect segue because I want to ask you a bunch of personal questions. Um, what, what learning has surprised you the most since you became CFO? Well, I guess um, the diversity of what I do is one of the big things. So when I took the job, I, it was kind of a leap into the dark because I didn't really know what I was going to be doing. And uh, I didn't really know where the office was on the spectrum of, of the transition. I didn't really know um, what the federal government was going to be coming up with. And so it was a bit of a leap into the dark, uh, a leap of faith. And uh, one of the positive aspects of what I do uh, is just the diversity. I mean, uh, in a given day, I may be doing interviews. I've done interviews in French as well. Um, I do. I may be uh, doing a video. I may be attending a gun show. I may be uh, dealing with policy issues in the office. So uh, I don't 
generally because there's there's 340,000 PAL holders in Alberta. So there are some people who are surprised I have a staff. Well, if they th- uh, because they think I just sit there all day with a rubber stamp going bang. It's, all, it's bang all you. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm personally authorizing all 340,000 PALs. But, um, but um, uh, you know, they, I'm, I may be helping to draft legislation, uh, deciding on, on a, uh, you know, a case that raises a policy question in the area. I may be uh, responding to concerns expressed by uh, a member of the public or a member of the legislature or, uh, you know, it's just such an incredible diversity. And, of course, you know, uh, talking to my staff and, um, you know, I have a deputy, a, long, uh, a long-suffering deputy. Uh, I'm, I'm not an easy person to work for because uh, I, I have high standards. I'm very demanding. And my, my deputy far exceeds any reasonable expectations I could have. Um, so I have to give kudos to him. Um and uh, an enormous thanks because it's only thanks to Patrick that I'm able to to do the things that I do because he takes a, a lot of the burden of, of day-to-day things off my uh, off my plate. Uh, but you know, just that range, the diversity of things that I do is uh, constantly exciting, constantly uh, rewarding, enriching. And although I'm not much given to uh, sort of um, uh, new agey sounding things. I feel like I'm growing. <laughs> growing. <laughs> yes. Okay. You know, nice. growing in my nice. abilities, my, this is a managerial job and I just feel that I'm constantly pushing new areas of my uh, managerial expertise as I approach uh, the many challenges we face every day. Very excited. I, I'm a fan of new agey stuff, so I like growing. <laughs> it's, uh, um, how have you been personally affected by the federal confiscation plans? In May 2020, OIC, October 22, uh, October 2022, handgun OIC, Bill C-21. How, yeah, are you personally targeted in all three of those? Um, well, um, I own a significant number of handguns. Um, yes. You know, from my collection, you know, my website, uh, and uh, so on. So most of them are, uh, I, I actually do displays of these uh, saying like, here are some of the things that are going to be affected. How much do you think this is going to affect public safety? You know, like when I was a kid, I wanted to be a pirate. So I have a, I have a Peter Soli reproduction of um, uh, Harper's Ferry 1807 flintlock pistol. It's covered by the transfer ban. You know, when was the last time a, a flintlock pistol was used in a crime in Canada. Probably 1825, and the guy had a patch on one eye and a parrot on his shoulder, you know. So the handgun ban is, or the handgun transfer freeze is a big one, Uh, although um, it's, uh, it, it, it doesn't take them away. It just means that I can't sell them. But that, you know, to be honest, I have never been much for selling anything anyway. I've always been buying because my goal was to establish a collection that I could, I actually have a not-for-profit organization I established with the intent of creating a museum. So even the loss of monetary value, which would be crippling to many people, would think it was an enormous blow. I didn't intend to sell them anyway. So can your uh, museum, can your nonprofit, can you transfer them to the nonprofit when you um, when you are no longer able to possess them? Like what, when you die, uh, is what I'm trying to say. Um, well, that assumes that I'm going to, and I, I figure that I'm, I'm just not. If going. I should have said if, so, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> only only the only the good die young, so right. so I'm safe. Because um, well, the confiscation happens at death, right? The uh, yeah, well, and that's one of the areas, uh, mm-hmm. one of the ways, um, but. Um, and there, so, but even people who uh, leave things in an estate, there are a few options for things that can be done. Uh, you know, things can be exported, they can be sold to a business. There's a few options, just very few, uh, and not practical ones right. for many right. people. But yes, I could put things in a museum. Um, okay. So either the, the one that I hope to establish or some other museum. Um, and I mean, I, I, 
frequently loan things to museums already because there's a lot of stuff that I have that museums don't have. So I currently, for example, have two firearms that I, I have to go and collect from a museum because I loan them for a display, but I'm hardly ever in that area. So I, <laughs> I do, haven't had time to get there and, and pick them up. So the handgun then was a big one. Um, generally, although I have nothing against modern, you know, very modern firearms, um, they're just not my thing. So I didn't have a lot of that kind of stuff covered by the order and council. Uh, but I have a Norinco CQA1, uh, which is, uh, you know, the, the uh, Chinese knockoff of an M4, an AR-15 platform carbine. Um, and I can say it openly because it's registered, so the feds know I have it. So, um, you know, that's not a huge monetary loss. It was, you know, roughly $600, $620 when I bought it. Uh, but as a matter of principle, if they offered me six thousand or sixty thousand dollars, I wouldn't take it. I would rather keep the gun than take that money. Um, but I may have no choice at some point. And uh, in my case, my ability to uh, continue in my position and advocate from the position that I have is more important than whether I'm able to keep that six hundred dollar gun. Um, then, uh, other things, you know, when, if they do expand this, we don't, uh, one of the things with this expansion, although there has been some suggestion that they would be covered by the order and council scheme for confiscation and compensation, um, they haven't explicitly committed to doing that. Uh, and so... Um, and we don't know exactly what firearms will be covered by that. So it's hard to say how that would affect me. I think it would have, probably it will have slightly more effect, but not huge given the nature of the things that I tend to be uh, interested in. Um, not huge in a monetary sense, but uh, in, like, it's a matter of principle. Like I said, with that, that, um, uh, CQA1 that I have, uh, it's a matter of principle. I don't want to give that up. Okay. Um, and I object as a matter of principle to them attempting to force me to do something that I should not do. Why should they be punishing me and other law abiding firearms owners for things that we have not done and will not be doing and are almost statistically highly unlikely to do. I mean, punishing the innocent will never deter the guilty. So... Um, Can you say that again? That bears repeating. Just say that again. Punishing the innocent will never deter the guilty. And so we need to... Um, uh, we as a society need to stop doing that. You know, um, we need to focus on uh, people who are actually doing bad things. There's enough of them to keep us busy and to, to use up any resources we're willing to de de dedicate to that purpose. So when I hear you, what you've just said, that gives, again, back to what I said at the beginning, I, I feel incredible, like, oh, like I want to move to Alberta because I, it gives me hope that there are, <laughs> that there are federal, what, what was the word that you corrected me on in the beginning, um, that there are public servants, I'll say, instead of bureaucrats, but there are public employees who get it to in the way that you get it on an issue that is so close to my heart. I feel it's so close to your heart and it, it helps, it gives me confidence basically that there's someone uh, in a level of, of authority with access to the decision makers and so forth who can share that point of view. Uh, so that's, but yeah, just basically thank you for what you said. Thank you for what you're doing. Well, um, you know, I, uh, I thank you. When, when people say that to me, I'm always a little like, oh, oh what do I, you know, but I, I appreciate that sentiment and uh, I will always do my best to justify the confidence that people show in me. Um, and how do you think that feeling that, or that sentiment that you expressed, um, is that why, I kind of want to say, how does that shape your views as a CFO? And I, I, I think I'm going to answer that and say, well, that's, that's kind of why you were hired to some extent. Well, is, is that right? 
Well, I, I mean, I think the, the, the reason, uh, so I wasn't the one who made the decision to hire me. <laughs> right, I'm asking, the wrong, I'm asking the wrong person. <laughs> but but I think it was, um, if, I, if I assess that situation correctly, yeah. um, they needed someone who had some credibility in the firearms community, and I have been in that community all my life. I still have my uh, 1972 junior membership in the Ontario Arms Collectors that my father bought for me in, uh, way back when. So that was quite a while ago. Um, that's over 50 years. Um, so um, I had that uh, going for me. But also, um, if you look at my uh, CV, and when I was a professor, I was also a, you know head of my area. I was an associate dean and so on. Uh, plus, prior to that, I was a banker. So I was a, a, at a managerial level uh, in international trade finance. So I had managerial experience um, in all of those and subsequently in volunteer roles. Um, so I had a track record of getting things done and of being able to, to identify people who, like my, my long-suffering Deputy Patrick, uh, who could help me to get things done. Um, and so uh, those, I think, are the, the key things. Someone who had credibility and someone who brought the actual managerial skills needed to the role. Because as I mentioned before, just knowing about guns isn't enough to be a chief firearms officer. And it's not also not enough just uh, to know about guns, to be a firearms officer, like my staff members, my firearms officers, my agents, my program coordinators, um, they have to have uh, a much broader skill base than that and, uh, and the ability to work hard and do very detailed um, uh, work on um, assessing situations and making wise decisions. I'd like to um, ask about what's positive. This will take us to the ending. What's positive? What What is, is some rosy, something rosy, positive, happy that Canadian gun owners have to look forward to in all this confiscation and prohibition and divisive rhetoric and so forth? What's some good stuff that we have to look forward to? Um, well, I guess uh, if you focus on, on the negative, then uh, there's lots that you could uh, weep and wail and moan about. Uh, but I think the positive thing is that um, these measures have brought us together in a way that I have not previously seen. Um, you know, we have in the past, and I alluded to this earlier in the interview, um, we have had sometimes too much of a tendency to say, well, uh, I'm a duck hunter and they're not coming after my duck gun. So whatever else they do is okay. Or, uh, you know, I'm, I, uh, only own revolvers. So if they're coming after semi-auto handguns, I'm not worried. Uh, but now people have realized that, that this is, um, a broader threat that there is, uh, more, uh, a, a more, uh, more cohesiveness is needed in our community. Uh, and we've always had that in terms of, of uh, our interpersonal relations. Like we've always been friendly with one another and, and so on. But I think now we see that uh, we're all in the same boat and we all need to be rowing it in the same direction. And so if there's anything positive, uh, I think that uh, it is that we have a new recognition of our need to stick together. Uh, we have a new recognition of what needs to be done in order to ensure our continued survival and flourishing. Uh, and, um, and what that means is spending more time with other gun owners who are amongst the greatest Canadians that we have in the country and in here in Alberta, the greatest Albertans. Terry Bryant, Chief Firearms Officer of Alberta, thank you for having spoken with me today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.